So I'm here to talk about some random stuff on what to do when stuff doesn't work. I mean, there are enough people here talking about what to do when a uh, system works. But from what I've seen, from what I've seen, uh, most of the time I've spent doing ops work is when somebody escalates, right? Uh, and the rest of the time, I spent preparing for those. Does it sound fine? So. Uh, what, what mostly uh, admins deal with are escalations and escalations are probably the bigger pain point than architecture setup and uh, there are various solutions that people have built which work great for large scale deployments but uh, when you set up a cloud based system and you start building The direction of mine. So, yeah. So, uh, what ends up happening is that no matter how well you set up a system, as your uh, application goes from say 100k users to a million or 2 million users, that week when it happens, the week that it goes viral, is probably when cloud actually pays off to use. So, it's okay. So uh, that is when cloud pays off to actually use because even though you haven't probably made a capacity plan for a few million users, the day it hits uh, Epic News site, Slashdot, or Reddit or whatever at the top of the list, that is the day that you have to actually get the system to work and that is the day then when you will get the maximum amount of load. And on that day, it is very unlikely that you will have planned for the load or the number of servers or the kind of errors you would have. So, uh, the spare time that I get is spent building stuff so that I can monitor systems, uh, fix systems, and tweak systems without using any of the standard mechanisms available. Uh, there are always great solutions for some of these problems. For example, uh, people do use Puppet a lot. People do use uh, built-in crons to do restarts. People have RPMs pushed to systems. There are companies like Splunk which sell you error log monitoring systems. But those are all solutions which either require a budget or time to set up or at least a couple of days to open the ports if you have a secure system, right? So everything that I'm going to demonstrate here pretty much started off as an attempt to uh, mine access logs. Uh, at a particular point, when we when a particular deployment went from about 100 servers to 200 servers, most of what we had done to analyze and understand the system completely went for a toss because suddenly we couldn't really look at 200 system, 200 graphs in one screen. Like it was not something that we expected would happen. It was just that the big screen that we had could show 50 graphs. After a particular point, trying to look at 100 graphs on the same day just by scrolling up and down every 15 minutes just seemed like a completely pointless exercise. And the spike lasted for about three days, maybe, right? For those three days, I needed 100 extra boxes. And for those three days, I didn't have any real monitoring other than people looking at graphs manually. And this is not really a uh, good problem to have when the load disappears in two days, but at the fact that we needed 200 servers at that point was because the people had not planned for that kind of load. Basically, the solution was throw more servers at it, wait till Monday. If till Monday we can't fix stuff, we will worry about it then, right? So, what do you do from like 5 p.m. Friday when something goes viral till Monday morning? That, that's this whole presentation. Uh, and it is not really a presentation, it's mostly code. So, uh, how many of you here have a basic understanding of Python? Okay. Uh, how many of you have used say dog, grep? Is a root con? So I'm guessing the dog hands. No? Okay. Uh, so what I'm what I'm planning to demonstrate here is uh, how to go beyond something like PDSH and use something that runs off uh, 
uh, a cloud of servers to aggregate your data and how to actually build a let's say a fake MapReduce system on short notice without a project. Right? So uh, what the, the challenge at that point was to figure out how many users are getting errors, how many of those errors are because of code that we have bad. Uh, and this data was thankfully being logged into places where I could grip and in patterns that I could grip. So I will <coughs> I don't know if anybody can read the code. Uh, can everybody see it correctly? Yes. At the back? No? Now, yeah. So basically, uh, there is a uh, tool, tool set called Fabric, which is very popular. <coughs> and Fabric comes with a bunch of things inside Fabric, which is used to run how Fabric runs jobs across machines. Okay, uh, it is called uh, Paramico, right? So what uh, Paramico does is that it lets you uh, start an SSH connection run a command on the other side using your agent running locally so that you don't have a type of password and collect the data back as a stream. So uh, what this code does or the part in the top does collecting restarts which is also probably better done with other things but uh, what this code does is it goes through the entire log file right looks for all requests which uh, or rather figures out which file is taking what time in this particular system and it basically runs it through all of these commands across all the boxes and collects the data into one machine, into one Python program. Now until this point this is no different from something like PDSH. Uh, how many of you have used PDSH? Okay. Uh, how many of you have tried? Fabric. Okay. Even. So uh, the real problem here is that when 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 we had four machines, I could go ahead and do this by hand on those four machines, right? The the real problem is that I have no control over as an admin. I hate to say this, but I have no control over how many machines are required to handle the load right now. I can make a plan for it, but those plans are pure conjecture, like. Right? The moment it hits the first number one and read it, uh, it's pretty much dead. Whatever plans I have. So at that point, to take a single command that I would run across one machine, run across, run it across like 600 machines, pull all that data back in a format that a program can understand. Like PDSH is great if you just need to run a command and forget about the actual result. You only care about success or failure. Uh, if you actually need to run uh, and get the output out and uh, I don't know if anybody can see it like I'm basically doing a group by out the result that I get back. Something like this needs to be written and kept. I will probably be sharing this code at the end of this presentation or put them up. But uh, as a responsible admin it is everybody's duty to like write random uh, basic framework tools that let you run commands across your systems. Not only that collect results across your systems, collect data across your systems. Uh, not at, at some particular point, you're going to hit the limit of what, how much you can process on one box, right? Uh, the real challenge of uh, an 800 server or 900 server deployment is that even if I run this across 900 servers, at some point or the other, I'm going to have too much data to process it locally, right? Uh, we hit that. We ended up writing two data files per machine and shipping one half to one machine, the one half to the other machine and have both of them aggregate and then the right machine aggregate onto the left machine and finally get an output uh, within a period of 5 minutes for every 5 minute update. So being able to monitor the system real time for a custom query was what this particular bit of code helped me do. And the fact that with this, with like a handful of code written during a production crisis that you can do this is why uh, the, 
the cloud infrastructure why, why you if you don't do that like if you can't write a script to monitor your entire system quickly for a parameter you don't know about you cannot really use the cloud and sleep comfortably like i was woken up 3 am to look at some one of these issues uh, so the fact that these kind of tools can be built and kept aside for cloud systems is one part of the equation the other part of the equation is the cloud keeps growing uh, there is no real membership in the cloud cloud beyond a given point so for example like today i can say that my machine has 800 boxes and these are the ips right which gives me no guarantee after 2 hours what will be the machines or the ips involved uh not only that you do not get to see do not get to see not only what machines are there but most likely you do not get to see uh uh where all each machines are how these machines are connected to as well so uh the topology of the network is out of your control in the crowd which basically brings you like if you happen to be using ec2 for instance uh when you spin up a node you have really no idea where it is actually which router it is connected to how far is any of the other nodes uh so we have a system which temporarily used to take the data nodes do a ping to the data nodes figure out the bottom 10% of machines which fall below the uh latency timings and just terminate it and this is sort of like a continuous process which basically created a uh optimized system in the beginning but which basically meant that every 20 or 30 minutes two or three of my machines would die off two or three new machines would spin up that was basically toss of the dice so what happens when you have machines coming up and down every 20 minutes how do i keep track of what machines have data or what machines and how old are they one of the solutions is to actually write the api or hit the ec2 api get the data out uh, and try to figure out whether to use that data uh, or rather uh, figure out how much alternative data i need for the each of those things so for any instance id that i have in the cloud i probably do not i'm not happy enough to just get an ip right i probably want to know that which rack does it sit on is it like a top rack bottom rack which availability zone does it sit in and trying to keep track of all of this uh and trying to hit the api when something like this happens basically had a different issue people kept throwing us off apis so if you keep hitting the api every half an hour or every 10 minutes worst case scenario to check if all the ips you have or all the apis you have the guys who are hosting the apis are probably not going to be happy with your right they expect you to hit this when a machine goes down or you want to spin up a new machine or do some activity not as a fixed load at the bottom so what we ended up using was what uh, hadoop used to coordinate large scale systems which is something called zookeeper uh, how many of you have here have looked at zookeeper so yeah zookeeper is not ultra complicated or well the way you use it is not ultra complicated it provides a equivalent of a windows registry for a large cluster is horrible thing to say about it but that that is what it does because it gives you like a slash path based naming system where you, for example i have a slash nodes field which contains all my ips each of those nodes contain a json dump of what i need to know about that ip and whenever a machine boots up it goes and updates this field and every five minutes it goes and updates that field inside my uh system which are actually going to an external vendor like amazon say they are something like that. so uh, at any given time to synchronization of uh i'll repeat the question so are there any synchronization problems there? because it's a separate database from let's say amazon the vendors so amazon database tells you the real state of your system or assume real state now you have now you have a what a copy of the database yes i do have a copy of the database elsewhere but since that is updated every five minutes from my cloud and also because it is initialized at boot time i probably have a better idea of what all machines i have from that system that an amazon system which i require to query not only that i have to actually wait for the request to come up so uh um, there is a leaf twist to the stale as well right so what we ended up doing was we needed each machine to know which all other machines exist in the node right 
So if I have 800 nodes, I have to fire 800 requests every five minutes to get that information, right? Whereas in, in this particular system, I don't have to do that. I, Zookeeper has this very nice feature called a watch. Okay, watch basically means I can say slash nodes watch for any change, right? At any point when that changes, that is the only time that the rest of the scripts will trigger. So an external API probably doesn't give me an ability to watch for things, but that's it. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that this was duplicated multiple times. For instance, uh, once this was set up, the Nagios alert suddenly got better because they could suddenly also figure out whenever a mission gets added. Uh, we had a uh, Memcache cluster to which whenever an IP is added, you need to actually not only change the IP in the list that you have, you have to actually go ahead, uh, go into the web servers in each of them and actually update the IP list that you have. These workflows basically got started becoming simpler to warn about. Like it is supposed to happen, but how does each web node check whether the IPs it has for the data nodes are relevant or current? Obviously, they refresh every few minutes, but I could suddenly write a script like what you saw to do that. Uh, but Onk is not probably the best way to write complicated scripts, right? Uh, people, some people prefer Perl. I personally prefer Python, and more than just using Python, I prefer to. Uh, I have a ridiculous hack which I built for future use. Uh, so, this bit of code, what it does is that it loads up a Python module, sends it over the wire, over SSH, over standard input in SSH, and runs my bit of Python code on that side. It's basically like remote, execute, remote code execution directly over SSH. Now, what this lets me do is that I no longer have an agent running on each box. So, I'll get to that point. So, other problem, large cloud requirements is that if you need anything done, you probably need something running on that box. Like if you have 800 boxes, you need something running on 800 of those boxes. Most of the time, that basically means that you have to push an RPM, push some code, at least SCP some code over there to execute. But when you are debugging stuff and you don't know what you are looking for, you probably can't really rely on something that somebody's already copied. So <laughs> this bit of code, what it basically does is it opens up a uh, module called odd, right? And converts every function in it into a chunk. Figures out the length of it. Loads up a Python program. A Python one-liner for that matter. Which loads it into a uh, temporary module called temp sandbox and runs it on the other box. So it basically meant that I avoided having an SCP step, which is what I would need in a production scenario because I would need to SCP in this file to 800 boxes, wait, then run the command across 800 boxes. That is how it is usually done. But at this point, I basically say, here is my code, here is it in memory, run it and give me the result. And I don't really care about writing a command. Right? Uh, this basically ended up having bigger letter side effects. It basically meant that at this point I, I, I no, no longer need to write an odd script. I can write more complicated scripts. I can write stuff that, for example, takes an IP, figures out what subnet it comes from. Right? Uh, I can take an IP lookup, do a GYP lookup. I can figure out that for this particular uh, geo, how many hits did I get in the last five minutes? Which is ridiculously complicated information to get for any kind of uh, built system that we had at that point, right? We had, a, we had something that would mine it within 20 minutes or 30 minutes, put it in a DB, let somebody query on it. But by that time, my ability to quench a particular subnet or drop a subnet on the edge was completely gone. Uh, there are scenarios where a particular IP submit will flood you with requests. Being able to figure out which IP submit is flooding you with requests and ban it is very critical to the system. Uh, and obviously for the stability of the platform. 
people, people will do DDoS, right? When DDoS happens, and when DDoS is happening a while back that I was watching. So we had like a list of uh, commands running perpetually, just mining this data, looking at it and writing bank rules. And that kind of uh, agility with the system is only very relevant if you have a system that you don't control uh, as it grows. Like a uh, few years back I used to work in Yahoo where things were very planned that there would be like a fixed step of like with, with two weeks before, ahead of time you would know which IPs you are getting, right? Compared to a system like that, the cloud ecosystem that I am in right now is completely scary because the moment you put a foot down in one place that the server is gone. Uh, moment you put critical data in one server, Amazon calls you up and says, uh, we are terminating the entire rack, can you please terminate it or take backups? Uh, things will keep changing all the time. So, the potential agility of doing random things at a random time when you are woken up is the reason why stuff like this gets written and uh, hopefully gets thrown away over Monday because most of what I have done here has probably survived a week at best. After that point, other people have come up and written better things. Written crons, loggers, indexes fund, error logs. Uh, that is pretty much all really I have to talk about. In particular, but I will take all kinds of questions. So, you uh, he could probably change his user agent, but he would probably have to like push it, push the user agent chain out every box, right? Yeah. Well, that is not what we saw. Like to say that that like what happens when you see a user agent spike for a particular given user agent and you're not expecting it in the system. Right? To figure out that is happening. So, if I knew the variables ahead of time, there are all these scenarios that I could prepare for. Uh, you said if I go down there was a single user agent yeah. on the fly. Yeah, the, the fact that you figured it on the fly. That was just a particular case in where the attacker was doing that. Yeah. So, usually the attacker would then try to my stages, and that would have used that. No. No, but I wouldn't be able to like look through the entire system and run a query across these hundred boxes to do something like this, right? The whole point is to run stuff ad hoc, like, right? You don't know what is coming up. Like, I, next thing somebody comes up, there might be something else I could identify with. Like, maybe he's not sending Google cookies. Maybe he's not sending the Google urgent trackers, right? Like, browsers will send it. I, I don't know what I'm looking for. That is why all this exists. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, little bit of trivia. So, how many of you uh, happen to use the Facebook API? Do you know what happened yesterday? Sorry. Do you happen to know what happened yesterday? So yesterday, Facebook accidentally turned on IPv6 for about two hours. So for for just a few, I'm pretty sure it's still turned on. Uh, let's see. Yeah, still turned on. So as you can see. This says Facebook, 0, 1, whatever, right, in hex. Uh, but they turned it on in preparation for IPv6 day next month. And what that basically resulted in was like suddenly everybody is like, oh, you don't have IPv6 routes set up already. And because they gave out three IPs, and the, the PHP uh, extension as such doesn't really figure out which one it's connected to, it just connects to whichever one is available. Uh, pretty much had to go de disable IPv6 resolvers on every box that I had access to. Uh, 
within a matter of 20 minutes while the DNS resolver started filtering bodies, right? And the fact that uh, I can run jobs across hundreds and or thousands of machines if whenever I want to, uh, and the fact that I can actually do it uh, not as a shell script. Like shell is a horrible language for anybody who needs to operate on data. Um, you put a space in the middle of some things and everything breaks, right? Like a file name has a space inside it, everything breaks. Which is the only reason that all this effort of sending Python bytecode exists. It is so that I don't really have to worry whether to put a backslash here or whether not to put a backslash here when I go this way, right? Um, it was a simple change, but the fact that you have to do it on a last scale within a few minutes is a uh, challenge that only the cloud brings. Uh, people might disagree with me saying that uh, there are large scale systems deployed by enough people before the cloud as well. They have all worked. But the only thing I have to say is that cloud really tells you that you don't have to plan for scale. It says that you can start with 10 servers and you can just grow organically. Right? I'm, I'm sort of dealing with the end result of that organic growth with all these random things. Yeah? M? Okay. Does it does it use an extra port? That is my fundamental issue. Yes, it does. It needs an agent. Yeah. So anything that requires an agent, anything that requires a port opening, is probably not a thing I want as a crisis tool. Unless if you say that this will be useful, and somebody says that a week before the crisis happens. <laughs> but I use uh, no parallel. Okay. No parallel. Which is a shell script parallel execution. Yeah. Over SMS. Yeah. Yes, but except what I'm, what I end up getting is not just uh, output from the shell script. Like for example, I could echo JSON out from each of these, and I could pass JSON in the fetcher, and I can get structured data out of remote systems. My real problem is that, like, how to get structured data out of the system? For example, uh, the user agent example was user agent number of terms, and uh, it was pulled out of the JSON structure. So the fact that you structure, these structure, uh, that's pretty much I have, that's my brain now. It is uh, great to work on the cloud for a lot of reasons because as I said before, the 100 to 200 might be a problem the way I look at it today, but for somebody who has 100 boxes and cannot put in 200 at any given time, for him it's like a business ending catastrophe. Right. So I'm, I'm not actually complaining about the cloud, but I'm just saying that the cloud basically brings out a lot of bad behavior in people and refusing to plan for scale. Okay, thank you.